this unhappy soldier is known as a wood murderer. But remember when you couldn't saw a straight line, the saw got stuck and buckled, and when you finished with the board, it looked like a demolition job? Well, maybe you didn't have quite so much trouble, but you probably discovered that there's a trick to using a saw. It's a simple enough job, but like anything else, it's simple if you know how. Right, soldier? All hand saws have certain general characteristics. The handle is made to fit your hand as snugly as a pistol grip. The business end of the blade is made up of a row of teeth. The size of the teeth depends upon the number per inch. Here they are unset. as they appear also in this down view sketch. But the teeth must be set in order to cut a kerf or groove wide enough to keep the saw from binding in the wood. By that we mean that every other tooth is bent slightly to one side of the saw, and the remaining ones are bent in the opposite direction. Here are the teeth set. This cross-section drawing of the saw teeth in the board shows that they make a groove wider than the blade. That prevents the saw from binding, from being caught fast in the wood. There are two types of hand saws. The cross cut for sawing across the grain, the rip saw for sawing with the grain. They differ in the way the teeth are sharpened. These are the teeth of a cross cut saw. To get maximum cutting quality, the front slope or breast of each tooth is sharpened at an angle of 15 degrees from the vertical. That's the angle outlined in black. In this top view of the cross-cut saw, notice that the teeth themselves are filed across the saw at a 65 degree angle to give them a sharp point. In this drawing of two teeth, the filing makes a V-slot down the center of the row, the distinguishing mark of a cross-cut saw. Now, before using the cross-cut hand saw, make an accurate measurement on what you want to saw. Then mark it off with a distinct straight line. Grip the handle as you would a pistol, your trigger finger guiding the saw. You also guide it with your left thumb, steadying the timber with your left hand. First, pull back with a slight downward pressure to make a small kerf. Let the saw cut by its own weight. Don't force it. You might kink the blade and ruin it. Hold the saw against the timber at a 45 degree angle. Keep a little to the left to give your arm free swing. Relax. Take full advantage of the length of the saw. Forcing the saw pushes it off your straight line. To recover, Make short strokes with only the point end of the saw cutting. Twist the handle in the same direction that you want to cut until you're back on the line. Sawing's pretty simple, at least for some people. Normally, you don't use a cross-cut saw for cutting with the grain. Better watch a man who knows what he's doing. He's using the rip saw, which is specially designed to cut with the grain. Remember, rip saw with the grain. Here again, the trick is the way in which the teeth are filed. The forward slope sharpened to an angle of eight degrees from the vertical. Again, the angle outlined in black. Here is a downshot sketch of the rip saw. The teeth are filed straight across or at 90 degrees making them cut with the grain. Handle the rip saw the same as you would the cross cut. With one exception, hold it in a more vertical position at an angle of about 60 degrees.
If you follow these directions, sawing is just as simple as, well, sawing. Here's a side view sketch of both saws. Remember, front slope of the rip saw teeth, 8 degrees, front slope of the cross cut, 15. Here's looking down at both saws. Teeth of rip saw filed at 90 degrees, cross cut at 65 degrees. But no matter how carefully you treat a saw, even the best one will become dull and start to give you trouble. When that happens, there's only one answer. Sharpen it and do it immediately. There are several steps in sharpening a saw. Jointing the teeth, that is, making them the same height as your first move. Use a file clamp or jointing tool. Tighten the screw just enough to hold the file, but not tight enough to bend it. Make two or three light strokes from one end of the saw to the other. Check between every few strokes to see if the teeth are even. Remember, this means each tooth on the whole row, not just in one section. Only when all the teeth touch the file is the first step finished. All teeth the same height. That's the basic idea. Then the teeth must be set or bent with a setting tool. Go down the entire length of the saw, setting every other tooth so that the pointed end is out, each point in the same direction and at the same angle. Each tooth should be set not more than one half of the thickness of the tooth and one third the depth. The setting tool can be gauged to fit the size of any teeth. Then turn the saw around and set all the teeth you skip. And here's your net result. All odd numbered teeth pointing to the right, even numbered to the left. Next and more difficult is the filing of the teeth. Set the saw very low in the vise so that a bare half inch appears above the clamp. That device the soldier is setting up holds the file at the correct angle. Move the frame and file to the first tooth at the point end of the saw. The saw being a cross cut, the angle of filing will be 65 degrees across the front slope. So move the frame to one of the end points. Now swing the frame so that the file fits snugly into the groove. Angle of filing on the front slope itself will be 15 degrees. Find this by releasing the thumb screw and revolving the handle until the file rests against the front slope of the tooth. Once the filing device is set, you can start to work. Notice how you file only on the forward stroke, lifting the file from the slot on the back stroke. When you've filed every other tooth down one side, reverse the saw in the vise. Swing the filing device to the right, and adjust to get the angles of the same size in their new position. Here again you follow the rule. File only on the forward stroke, lifting the file from the slot on the back stroke. When you jointed the teeth, you flattened them, so file each one now until that flat surface has been eliminated. In sharpening the rip saw, the procedure is the same except for the angle of the teeth, which you'll recall have a reading of 90 degrees across the front slope. So the angle for the file across the saw is 90 degrees, or the middle point on the knob.
Now set the file so the front of the tooth is sharpened at an angle of eight degrees with the vertical. Hold the filing frame at right angles to the blade. Make short, decisive strokes and you'll get a clean, sharp edge. For the final step in sharpening the saw, place the saw blade on a smooth, straight piece of timber and pass an oil stone lightly over the side of the teeth. This will remove the burrs and make the teeth on both sides of the saw form a straight line. Two or three strokes will be plenty. Now oil it well to prevent rust and to give smooth operation. Take care of your saw. Keep it clean, sharp, oiled. Put it away when not in use. Then when you need it, it'll do a real job for you. Drilling holes is just as simple as sawing when done right. On engineer jobs, you'll find holes are necessary to receive drift bolts, spikes, or bolts. The tool the soldier's using is called the brace and bit. The bit is the part of the tool that actually does the work of boring. Simple as it looks, it's really composed of six different parts, each of which has a definite job. The screw point which feeds the bit into the wood is called the spur. The nibs are those sharp blades on the outer edge that make the hole. The lips are the transverse cutting blades. They bite down into the wood. The twist or flutes compose this spiral section. It carries the chips up the bit to the surface. Here's the shank. And finally, the tang which fits into the brace. The other part of the drill, the brace, is composed of a head, handle, ratchet box, and chuck. To assemble, drop the bit as far down into the chuck as it will go. Grasp the chuck with left hand and turn the handle counterclockwise till it's tight. Now to operate, the spur is placed at the point where the hole is to be drilled. A little pressure is needed at the start, but once the lips begin biting into the timber, the bit will feed itself into the wood. Keep that bit perpendicular. Don't change the direction of the hole after it's started or you'll snap the bit. To withdraw it, reverse the rotation to free the spur and resume the forward rotation as you lift the bit. When you want to drill the hole all the way through the timber, continue drilling until the spur starts coming through the opposite side. Then withdraw the bit and finish the hole from the other side. This will prevent the wood at the rim of the hole from splitting and leaving jagged edges. When you're in a spot where you can't get a full turn, use the ratchet. Turn the collar on the ratchet box to disengage the paw. The bit will bite into the wood on every other turn. To reverse the ratchet, turn the collar in the opposite direction. Then you'll be able to withdraw the bit easily from the wood. A dulled bit is of no use at all, so keep it sharpened and use the file issued for this purpose. To sharpen the nibs, hold the bit with the nibs up against a workbench or against any object that will give you a firm base. File the nibs on the flat inward sides only. Keep the surface as flat as it was originally and you'll have the best cutting edge.
To sharpen the lift, turn the bit right side up. Rest the spur firmly against the edge of the base you're using. File only the upper and beveled side of the lips. Be sure to maintain the original bevel, which is about 30 degrees. The same thing goes for the care of the bit as for all other cutting tools. Don't bore through nails or grit. Keep that bit oiled, keep it clean, and keep it sharp. If you follow these directions, you'll be able to use the tool the way it was meant to be used. 